Greetings, dear gentlemen. Today you will hear a story about adultery. Well, let's listen to it. My name is Michael, and my wife is Jennifer. We have been happily married for 17 years. Our wonderful family consists of two lovely children, our son Jacob and our daughter Emily. Jennifer has been coming home late from work all the time lately, and today was no exception. It was close to 10 o'clock at night when she finally arrived. By this time, the children and I had already had dinner and completed our homework. They had been in bed for about an hour, apparently not understanding either the absence of their mom or its cause. This recent event has deeply upset me, as I have been carefully analyzing our financial situation for the last hour. Over the past two years, our situation has deteriorated significantly. Our income has dropped dramatically, but my wife didn't seem to notice. She continued to spend money without hesitation, as if our financial difficulties did not exist. Just a few minutes ago, I completed the hard work of paying the last bills, realizing that we would barely be able to hold out for a few more months. Against the background of this alarming situation, I thought about my life plans and what lies ahead. I may have made a grave mistake. For the past two years, I've been fixated on an impending time bomb, not knowing if it will eventually explode and when. I always expected her to explode, but over the years, doubts began to overcome me. I could not determine how long she stood and silently watched me. Lately, I have been more and more immersed in my thoughts, and as a result, I have lost track of time. In the end, she broke the tense silence by crossing her arms and putting on her usual expression of contempt. Michael, I want a divorce, she said. At that moment, I was struggling to soar out my emotions. My spirit was so heavy with doubts and self-loathing that I was almost numb from the new feelings that arose. The situation could not be called humorous, but despite its seriousness, I tried to suppress laughter. After 17 years of marriage, my wife suddenly announced that our journey together was coming to an end and that everything we painstakingly built would be destroyed. Surprisingly, a long-forgotten feeling flashed through me, causing an almost imperceptible smile, relief. I looked at her, allowing myself a farewell tour of the cherished memories of our happy days. But soon, the harsh reality reasserted itself. I was a more skilled programmer than a manager. Unfortunately, in the professional world, programmers often climb the career ladder, becoming project managers, then department heads, and finally senior managers. And so, I found myself in the role of Senior Product Development Manager, a position that turned out to be more decorative and meaningful, an intricate facade for an experienced salesperson. However, among the available candidates, I was the most qualified for this position. I single-handedly created our main product line, nurtured it at the very beginning, and contributed to its growth over the course of six consecutive improvements. I have gained an unsurpassed understanding of our product. When clients were looking for answers, I gave them. Where our employees faced problems, I found solutions for them. With a new hairstyle and an expensive suit, I certainly looked the part. The substantial salary increase and tempting benefits that accompanied my promotion were undoubtedly attractive. I can say that I'm happy with my work, but deep down, I long for the programming world that I once loved so passionately. Unfortunately, my current position did not leave me the opportunity to indulge in programming. Countless meetings and constant phone calls took up all my time, leaving no opportunity to dive back into the lines of code. I was forced to watch as a new wave of young programmers took the reins of power into their own hands. Against the background of a group of young people striving to surpass each other with their novelties, I could not help but feel a sense of admiration and envy. Of course, being a boss is good, but deep down, I dreamed of a different range of responsibilities. Therefore, it was not surprising that I was eventually fired from my position at Chicago Technology Solutions. To tell the truth, if I was responsible for myself, I would have made the same decision. My attendance at meetings became rare at best, and numerous missed deadlines did not yield results. Although I did not seek dismissal, I did not make much effort to maintain my position at CTS. I was in a state of prolonged frustration. It took almost three months before I was finally able to overcome the initial state of depression and gather strength for further work. Unfortunately, my attempts to move forward were extremely unsuccessful. It took another month of mental anguish to find a way out of the situation that had captured me, albeit imperfect, but at least acceptable. 
Without a doubt, I believe that if it weren't for the presence of my children, I would have gone crazy. Their unchanging daily routine and innocent presence served as a guiding star for me, helping me to regain positivity and direction in life. Every day, I followed a simple routine. Breakfast, school, afternoon tea, homework, dinner, sleep. This recurring mantra became a guiding star for me, leading me on a path that I never expected. With unwavering determination, I plunged headlong into the role of a domestic father, taking on all the responsibilities associated with it. Housework and driving became my new fields of activity, and I diligently took them up. To my surprise, my presence in the house brought sincere joy to the hearts of my children. It was thanks to this new connection that I began to realize my importance and the valuable contribution that I could make. Although I often felt insignificant, my wife never acknowledged any changes in our family dynamics. She didn't even seem to notice it. I met Jennifer Riley at a frat party, and I almost missed this meeting. I joined the fraternity solely to secure future opportunities for myself after graduation, not to throw parties during my studies. I was convinced that I would need any help I could find. I wasn't worried about my academic performance, as my grades were excellent, but in everything else, height, weight, appearance, character, I couldn't help but feel like a completely average person. But Jennifer, who had the same level of averageness, somehow managed to radiate an amazing charm. She may have been a bit of an ordinary person, but I was fascinated by her presence. It took me a long time to gather the courage to start a conversation with her as I watched her from afar, fascinated by her unique charm. Perhaps our first meeting was short and inconspicuous, but in the following weeks, we crossed paths again and took the opportunity to introduce ourselves to each other. Coffee dates and joint classes in the library soon became a common thing for us. Continuing to get to know each other, it took about two months before our first official date took place. From that moment on, my life turned into an extraordinary journey filled with 15 years of pure happiness next to Jennifer. Our courtship may have been relatively short, but our engagement was even shorter. Shortly after graduation, we exchanged vows and settled into our first apartment in the bustling city of Chicago. It was an exciting chapter that marked the beginning of our married life together. Every day, we set off on the same journey, getting together on the morning and evening train to our first places of work. Financially, we were barely making ends meet, but we found solace in coping with these difficulties as a team. It seemed that we had almost everything in common, family background, dating experience, interests, and aspirations. Where our preferences did not completely coincide, we easily complemented each other. If I failed in some area, Jennifer was successful, and vice versa. I took over the management of our shared finances, and Jennifer shone in the development of our social ties. Together, we found a harmonious balance that allowed us to overcome life's obstacles, always supporting each other. We synchronized not only our personal lives, but also family schedules, working together as a team. We began to thrive over the next few years. We both received multiple promotions, which contributed to our success. Our circle of friends expanded significantly, bringing us joy and new acquaintances. We diligently saved money, which allowed us to buy our first house and, at the same time, not deny ourselves the pleasure of traveling and having fun. Our intimate life reflected the development of our relationship, starting with gentle hugs and affectionate kisses on the first date. As our connection deepened, we searched for more passionate moments, eventually realizing our exclusivity. After eight years of our life journey, Jennifer made the decision to quit her job when our beloved son Jacob appeared in our lives. After the joyful birth of Jacob, our family was replenished with daughter Emily a little over a year later. We made a significant move, buying a spacious three-bedroom house in the suburbs, which allowed us to accommodate our growing family and even adopt a fluffy pet. Together with the new house, we purchased a family sedan and a minivan, ensuring comfortable movement for all of us. In many ways, our life entered a pleasant average rhythm, two children, a beloved pet, a cozy house, and two reliable cars. I thought that such a state was the pinnacle of happiness, but I did not yet know that even greater happiness was waiting for me ahead. Shortly after Emily's first birthday, I was pleasantly surprised to receive a well-deserved promotion to the position of manager, which further increased my professional level. After the promotion, it seemed to us that the universe finally recognized what we hadn't noticed for years, that I was an ordinary person who quietly and meekly joined the general mass. 
The salary increase was significant, it should not be taken lightly, and we certainly did not underestimate its importance. In addition, the advantage of a flexible schedule was added to my new position, allowing me to work most of the week from home, occasionally coming to the office for important meetings with employees and management. It is often said that money cannot buy happiness, and I fully agree with this opinion. While money may not be able to directly buy happiness, it certainly can afford certain amenities and opportunities. Thanks to increased financial stability, we were able to invest in stylish clothes and self-care, prioritize treatment, and purchase a new home in a more attractive area. These changes have led to the fact that we have both gained self-confidence. I, who used to be considered average, now turned out to be slightly above average, and my wife, whom I always thought was beautiful, has turned into an incredibly attractive person. Our intimate life, which was already fulfilling, has reached new heights. In addition, our travels have become more enjoyable, and we have the freedom to spend time with our children while saving money for future retirement. When Emily started going to elementary school, Jennifer made the decision to return to work on a part-time basis, which brought a new dynamic to our lives. She quickly got a job at a startup marketing firm, which she believed she would like. Her daily routine was as follows. She drove the kids to school before going to the office and finished her day when it was time to pick them up. This routine was the perfect addition to our lives. Since her salary was not the main one, we could save. According to my calculations, by the time our children graduate from college, we will have saved enough money to retire and enjoy a comfortable life. Quite by chance, just three months before our 15th wedding anniversary, I stumbled upon the horrifying revelation of my wife's infidelity. Ironically, this discovery happened on my own birthday, although I didn't know about the evidence until two days later. It took me several weeks to connect all the dots and understand the truth. At first, I dismissed my wife's desire to take a more active part in work at the new place, believing that it meant she would work a few extra hours a week and I would take on the responsibility of picking up the children from school. But these changes in our daily routine did not have a significant impact on my schedule and I readily took on the responsibility of picking up the children without complaint. After about three months, I began to notice that my wife was becoming more and more anxious and distant. Worried, I asked her about it and she explained that she was just trying to find herself at work and was experiencing some stress trying to lighten her burden. I decided to take on additional responsibilities around the house. Unfortunately, our once ardent intimate life began to fade noticeably. We decided to talk openly about it, and she frankly said that she no longer felt the need to engage in intimacy with the fervor of a rabbit, citing her age. It was the first time I heard such frank words from her, but we made efforts to rectify the situation. After a little revival, our intimate life came to nod again, and I did not dare to touch on this topic for fear of provoking a quarrel. I was close to breaking down when an unexpected find forced me to face the truth. The weather got noticeably colder, and I started looking for my sweater. Since I took on the duties of a laundress, I sometimes confused the closets in which our clothes were stored. Rummaging on the shelf of my wife's closet among a collection of old shoe boxes, I came across a hidden gift. It was impossible not to notice, a pink box decorated with a white ribbon, clearly from a lingerie store. My excitement increased when I noticed a postcard addressed to my beloved. A brief internal struggle ensued in my head. Should I immediately delve into its content or be patient and wait? In the end, curiosity won out, and I decided to open it. The anticipation that after reading the postcard, I would admire my wife, did not allow me to restrain my impatience. I grinned when I read the message, in which they kindly asked for forgiveness for wrapping the gift on your birthday. You can unwrap your true gift, the contents of the box, and when I put on what's inside, you can take my last remaining innocence. Love, Jennifer. For the next 48 hours, I did my best to impress her. I met her at the door with a bouquet of flowers, pampered her with a foot massage, cooked her favorite dish, but her reaction was not what I expected. It seemed that she simply tolerated my displays of affection. On my birthday, I made sure in advance that the children did their homework, hoping not to disrupt an unexpected surprise. But I was shocked when Jennifer came home late from work. To my bewilderment, she asked what we would have for dinner. However, I was willing to play along with her to keep the element of surprise. I offered to go for pizza, which elicited cheers from the children. Having decided on our plans, we set off. But as soon as we were about to leave, 
the waiters performed a heartfelt song, Happy Birthday, for me. Surprise flashed in my wife's eyes, but she quickly regained her composure. I'll give you your present later, Michael, she said, smiling. The drive home was filled with tension, and I narrowly avoided an accident. The fifteen minutes spent waiting for the children to get ready for bed seemed excruciatingly long to me. The next fifteen minutes of waiting for them to fall asleep were no less excruciating. Fortunately, Jennifer returned from an urgent trip to the store for milk shortly after they fell asleep. When I got to the bedroom door, I noticed that Jennifer was not in the room. I lay down on the bed and waited. After a while, she came out of the bathroom, dressed in a long flannel nightgown, without makeup, with her hair in a ponytail. By this point, I was already beginning to feel a slight disappointment from the picture that was happening. When will I finally get my gift? I asked. She joined me in bed, slipped under the covers, and reached out to turn off the lamp in the bedroom. Oh, I almost forgot, she said. She opened the drawer of the bedside table and took out a small square box wrapped in bright wrapping paper with colorful balloons, which we used at our son's previous birthday. Handing it to me, she said, Happy birthday, dear. With these words, she rolled over on her back, turned off the lamp, and fell asleep. I was too stunned to even open her gift. The next day, my depression flared up with renewed vigor. I kept replaying the events of the past day in my head trying to figure out what I had done that cast a shadow on our evening. I was completely at a loss. For almost two weeks, I fell into despair. This cursed gift seemed to mock me, its bright pink hue almost blinking, serving as a vivid reminder of my failure. I've heard all these cliches before, the husband is always the last to know, ignorance is bliss, and to be honest, I really was in the dark. The idea that Jennifer might be unfaithful was so alien to me that it didn't even occur to me. But when she called home 13 days after my birthday, informing me of her late arrival in connection with Alan's 30th birthday, this was the first thought that struck me. And the employees arrange a holiday for him, maybe I'll come quite late, she said. I don't remember answering her or even going to the closet in the bedroom, but I remember looking at the empty place where my gift once lay. The excruciating pain in my chest and the subsequent vomiting attack in the bathroom are also vividly imprinted in my memory. For some time, which I would not like to remember, I was visited by the thought that I had had a heart attack, and for a fleeting moment, I even wished that it was true, longing for the possibility of my imminent demise. Alan Henderson, Jennifer's boss, was a deceitful and clever advertising manager who turned out to be several years younger than both Jennifer and me. I have encountered him only once, and I remember that I felt a strong dislike for him, primarily because of his incessant insincerity in conversation. It was Emily who brought me back to reality. Are you okay, Dad? Her worried voice broke through the fog in my mind, and it took me a few moments to focus on her tear-stained face looming over me. I'm fine, honey, I reassured her, forcing a weak smile. Dad just ate something that his stomach didn't like. I'll be out in a minute. In the end, I managed to escape from the confinement of the bathroom. Although much of what happened after that remained in my memory, I only remember that I reached for my forgotten bottle of whiskey, the dusty appearance of which testified to my inattention. Judging by the headache that overtook me the next morning, I realized that I had drunk several glasses in a desperate attempt to numb the pain. I didn't know when Jennifer came home, but when I came across her in the kitchen, feeding our children with apparent normality, it destroyed all the remaining fragments of love that I kept in myself. Only a faint tremor that flashed across her face when she sat down to eat extinguished all the remaining affection in me. It was an incredibly subtle shift, barely perceptible, but it was undoubtedly present. I would like to tell a story about how I courageously stood up to my unfaithful wife, but in fact, I was completely devastated. I was immobilized by the weight of my emotions. I could hardly find the strength to even move, and the situation only worsened further. For several weeks, I existed in a state of emptiness, being only a shell of my former self, painfully aware that my wife was just doing household chores, not paying attention to the crushing revelation. Every day, I sank more and more into despair, convinced that I had already reached the lowest point imaginable. Only on the weekend, on the day of our 15th wedding anniversary, did I finally gather the strength to get out of my stupor and make a decision. Up to this point, I was wallowing in my own weakness, fully aware of my inaction. 
perhaps I was in a state of shock, although most likely there is some technical psychological term describing my behavior. If my father were alive, he would just call me a fool. He was right. The fog of confusion in my mind finally dissipated when my wife told me about her plans for the upcoming trip to a work conference. It dawned on me that she would be absent on our anniversary. I couldn't understand why this fact mattered so much to me, but it just added another layer of disrespect to us. But the pain was especially acute from the fact that she did not show any recognition of the significance of this date. When I drowned my grief and fell asleep on the night of our anniversary, when I woke up, anger rose in me. I had reached my limit. I hurriedly contacted a lawyer and made an appointment. I was determined to put an end to this pretense. I firmly believed that my life couldn't get any worse. Few people knew that I was wrong. The fierce determination with which I entered the lawyer's office was quickly replaced by a destructive feeling of disbelief. I was well aware that divorce can be a difficult process, but reality hit me like a brick. At first, I thought that my wife's infidelity would play in my favor, but to my horror, my lawyer systematically ruined my case. I had no concrete evidence of her infidelity, and even if there were, it would not have had a significant impact on the outcome of the case. By law, our property had to be divided equally, and I had no advantages. Moreover, I had no reason to prove that my wife was not suitable as a parent, so joint custody seemed to be the best option. The difference in income tipped the scales even more in her favor, since I had to pay both spousal maintenance and child support. It was becoming more and more likely that my wife would be entitled to primary custody. Besides, she probably would have had the right to stay in the house for the sake of our children. It was a bitter pill when I realized that my wife was cheating on me, and I was pretending to be a fool. My emotions changed from deep sadness to complete despair. A few weeks later, my unfaithful spouse even had the audacity to ask about my well-being. You don't look well, Michael. Is something bothering you? What is it? She asked, feigning concern. Meanwhile, I just drifted along with the flow of life, feeling lost and empty. And then, suddenly, the news came about my dismissal from work. I didn't know yet that this would turn out to be the best thing that happened in my life. It was a glimmer of hope that came when I came across the evening news. As I sat immersed in a sea of grim news that seemed to reflect my own despondency, a glimmer of another version appeared among the stories of hopelessness. One headline caught my attention, a well-known company from the East Coast filed for bankruptcy. Former employees were now forced to struggle with the unknown regarding their latest salaries and the fate of pensions. Strangely, this message aroused a feeling of empathy in me. It dawned on me that there are people who may find themselves in an even more difficult situation than me. But when the news anchor returned to the screen, a sobering analysis followed. While employees are likely to win a lawsuit against their bankrupt employer, it doesn't really matter in the end. The harsh reality was that they had nothing left. All the funds disappeared, and the employees were in a state of financial collapse. It didn't take much effort to put all the fragments together and develop an elementary plan. If there was nothing to take, then the wife could not claim anything. We would be left with nothing, which means we would not share anything. Of course, this meant that I was sabotaging myself, but considering that I was already doomed to lose half of everything, then is it really important for me to have the rest? My initial plan was simple enough. Since I was currently unemployed, I decided not to look for a job. Instead, I decided to squander all our savings until there was nothing left. Admittedly, it was a somewhat reckless idea, and even I doubted its feasibility. Nevertheless, it gave me a sense of purpose, something to grasp at in the conditions of chaos. Two years doesn't seem like an eternity, but the days seemed painfully monotonous, especially when I was alone most of the time. It became obvious that Jennifer was the lifeblood of our circle of friends. As she moved away from me, I realized the lack of truly deep and meaningful connections. The fact that I was an only child made my loneliness even worse. I found myself in a state of deep loneliness, having prematurely lost both parents, my father from a heart attack and my mother from cancer. With their absence, I was left completely alone in this world. Although a detailed account of how I lived is likely to be tedious, I can briefly describe these two years as nothing short of horror. In the midst of this devastation, my children have become the only source of light in my life. I have never been prone to excessive spending, scrupulously watched every penny spent, but there was a shift in me. 
I started withdrawing modest money weekly, carefully saving it for certain purposes. After about two months, I realized that our expenses were not going at a pace that could bring significant results. It became obvious that I have a strong inclination to save money but no ability to spend it effectively. In this regard, I decided to step up my efforts and change the initial strategy. As a result, I decided to enroll in the Executive MBA program, despite the high cost of training. In addition, this program was conveniently located in my region. In one fell swoop, I made a significant investment, almost $120,000. In addition, I impulsively purchased a new luxury SUV, which cost me a staggering $60,000. I allocated a significant sum of $260,000 to fully finance the educational savings accounts of my children. In addition, I indulged in a lot of spending, investing several thousand in a new wardrobe. Furthermore, I began to withdraw cash more and more often. Twice a week, I took the kids to school, went to the bank, and drove by the lake. Although I've never really gambled, I saved a small amount of money from time to time to entertain myself. I spent enough to create the illusion of a day spent at the casino, with receipts for lunch, snacks, and parking. Most of my funds were stored in a secure wall safe located in our garage. It served as my personal reserve, designed to protect me in case of disputes related to divorce. Another significant item of expenditure was the establishment of permanent private surveillance of my wife and her lover. I spared no expense, requesting exhaustive documentation, including videos, photographs, and a daily log of their actions. I'm ashamed to admit how much this event cost me. You're probably wondering if my wife noticed my unusual spending. I would say yes, except for the money spent on gambling, which went unnoticed. I had to tell my wife about the transfer of funds to our children since her signature was required on the custody accounts. She must have noticed the new car and wardrobe, but she never mentioned them. I'm sure she thought I was working conscientiously and that we were still living a comfortable lifestyle. It is interesting that she herself made some purchases about which I was silent. I have often wondered who benefits from her frequent underwear purchases, but this topic has never been raised. Despite our cordial communication and daily exchange of opinions, it seemed that we just tolerated each other like roommates who have a mutual dislike. The time spent with my children was truly priceless. It became the main event of my life. It was a priority for me to encourage and support their various interests. We solved homework together, played exciting games, and our adventures included visits to parks, exciting bike rides, and trips to the cinema. Since I took on the role of a home cook, they helped me with great interest. To keep them enthusiastic, I discovered some simple recipes and allowed them to actively participate in the cooking process. Jennifer sometimes attended our family holidays, although I did not make any purposeful efforts to attract her to participate in them. If she decided to take part, she just did it without my participation. Having no contacts on this issue, I received a weekly report with a detailed description of my wife's activities. At first, I thought she was in touch with her boss, but later, it turned out that it was several people from her workplace. Over time, the company's clients also got on the list of her lovers. Did it bother me? Not very. I already had suspicions about her behavior, so the presence of concrete evidence did not have an emotional impact on me. The material I encountered wasn't nearly as exciting. The video resembled poorly directed adult content, and although it evoked a slight sense of satisfaction, it was rather meager. It became obvious that Alan Henderson did not have sufficient skill as a lover. Despite the fact that he had the opportunity to communicate with several women, this was an unexpected discovery. Judging by the gifts my wife received from him, I assumed that they were in some kind of romantic relationship, but it turned out that these were rather random meetings with benefits. He just got into a mediocre relationship with my wife, and she willingly allowed it. Despite his size below average, a similar pattern was repeated with the other six men who met with my wife. But there was one special client, a small and nerdy-looking man who completely embodied the image of a weirdo with glasses and pocket protection. He really poured out his desires on Jennifer. It's hard to tell from the quality of the photos and videos if she enjoyed it, but from my point of view, it was quite uncomfortable and potentially painful for her. After about a year, I realized that I haven't felt a drop of desire or passion for intimacy since I started on this path. 
Surprisingly, it didn't bother me much. This only added frustration to my already miserable existence. Therefore, after a year, I decided to stop monitoring. Looking through the materials received had become a tedious task, and I had seen enough of them. Despite classes, taking care of children, and gambling, I had a significant amount of free time. It was then that I decided to shift the focus to life after marriage, which I assumed would eventually become a reality. As part of this new direction, I started a new exercise regime. I have always maintained a decent level of physical fitness. I could not boast of anything outstanding. However, over time, I managed to make noticeable progress in bench press and running endurance. I believe that the presence of massive muscles and an attractive appearance are largely determined by genetics, and unfortunately, I did not belong to either category. But nevertheless, I was personally pleased with my appearance. Anticipating the need for employment in the future, I began to study the latest achievements in my former industry. It became obvious that a one-year break from work had thrown me even further than I had initially thought. Therefore, I began to devote several hours a day to familiarizing myself with the latest advances in technology. I devoted a significant part of my time to studying software systems, paying special attention to my former company, CTS. It became obvious that they were experiencing a lack of progress. Despite the fact that they managed to maintain their market share and stable incomes, they did not achieve success in the technology industry. It became clear to me that in an ever-evolving field, standing still means moving backward. In addition, I devoted a significant part of my time to studying divorces. Although I allowed myself to develop vindictive plans for my future ex at some moments, the bulk of my efforts were focused on studying the impact of divorce on children. I have already made significant progress in dealing with my own pain, and the presence of my children has played a crucial role in this healing process. It was important for me to be fully prepared for the upcoming process of their transition. But I found that there is a huge amount of information, most of which, in my opinion, is irrelevant or misleading. As my adventure continued, after about eight months, panic set in. My wife began to stick to a regular schedule, coming home at the usual time and even engaging in conversations with me, asking about how the day went. Naturally, I answered abruptly, but she wouldn't let up. To my surprise, she began to dress more provocatively in bed, apparently trying to revive the intimacy lost in her former life. But a few weeks passed, and the situation changed for the worse. For a year and a half, she was indifferent, just doing her duties. But now she began to be interested in her lack of communication, express her concerns, and look for answers. She started talking about the restoration of our marriage, but I went into complete silence in response. Her attempts at reconciliation continued until her birthday came. On this day, I left her gift on the dining table, wrapping it with the same wrapping paper that she had previously used for my gift. The contents of the gift should not have been surprising either. It took half a year before I finally opened the last birthday present I received from my wife. I came across my birthday present in the instant shopping department of our local convenience store. It was a watch with a cheap digital dial. At first, I felt a surge of anger when I realized that my gift was a $9.95 purchase at a fast food store. But soon, this annoyance dissipated when I noticed that they had a suitable female model. I decided to let go of my resentment and bought it, intending to give it to her later. It took 18 months before I finally handed her the watch. I would really like to see her reaction, but unfortunately, I wasn't there when she opened the watch. The children and I had an impromptu movie night, which is why we returned home quite late. The next day, she left before the children and I woke up. Suddenly, everything was back to normal. Jennifer began to spend more and more time in the office, and our conversations at home became sparse. In the end, it happened. She said the words I expected, Michael, I want a divorce. I was hoping that she would quickly start the process, but it took almost a week before I officially handed her application. It was almost comical to read its contents, the alleged grounds were spousal and child support, uneven distribution of property in her favor, as well as claims of mental and emotional cruelty. I waited patiently until the next month, the day before our hike with the children. I made sure that they were not around when I started to perform the necessary actions. After six days of outdoor recreation and recuperation, we returned home and found Jennifer waiting for us in the living room. 
She was sitting alone and looked unwell, probably had a stomach virus. As I watched her, I wondered which aspect of the situation caught her off guard the most. She didn't know yet that I had filed a counter-application for divorce, stating adultery as the basis and demanding ownership of the house, the only remaining significant property, and full custody of the children. I demanded payment of spousal and child support, taking into account my unemployment and the fact that for the last two years, the care of our children has been solely on me. In addition, I took the controversial step of filing attachment alienation lawsuits against Jennifer's seven love partners. Although I had no illusions about winning any of these cases, I knew that the legislation of the state of Illinois allows such actions, and therefore approached the situation with all determination. Similarly, I filed civil lawsuits against Jennifer's employer and companies associated with three clients who engaged in illegal relationships with my wife. And again, I didn't have high hopes of winning these court battles. Still, negative publicity could do me good. As a strategic move, I decided to send Jennifer's parents and her best friend a DVD with her best scenes. It should have made it clear that I wasn't afraid to use it as evidence against her. It was extremely important for her to know about the evidence I had, which was already mentioned in the counterclaim, but I didn't want to leave anything to chance. When the children had a snack and went to their rooms to get ready for bed, they did not seem to pay any attention to their mother. In turn, she did not make any attempts to communicate with them. I went to the refrigerator to get a beer and then settled in the living room on a chair opposite Jennifer. She didn't look me in the eye for quite a while, and I just focused on enjoying the drink. Not only did she look unwell, but she was crying, perhaps out of resentment. In the end, she plucked up the courage and spoke in a barely audible voice, it will ruin me. I waited patiently for her to meet my gaze, wanting to see her reaction to my answer. A few moments passed, but when her eyes finally met mine, I couldn't help but think, God, I hope so. Although I expected this moment to be more pleasant, but one tear that appeared in her eyes left me indifferent. When a tear escaped and flowed down her cheek, I couldn't help feeling detached. Do you hate me that much? Jennifer asked, her voice full of determination. I took a pause to collect my thoughts and answered, No, Jennifer, I don't hate you. Hate takes effort. To be honest, I didn't put any effort into you at all. All my attention and energy are focused exclusively on taking care of myself and our children. She tried to intervene but I quickly interrupted her, not wanting to let her tarnish the honest reputation of a good spouse. That's enough. I will not allow a worthless person like you to defame my wife's good name. She was a loving and compassionate woman, my closest confidant and life partner, and most importantly, a devoted mother of our children. She died. You are the person who replaced her, but I see in you only a dissolute person who has taken over her body. Don't even try to talk to me as if there's some kind of connection between us. There was a long silence before she spoke again, and there was desperation in her voice. What should I do now? I thought for a moment before answering, is this a rhetorical question, or do you really want to hear my advice? Without giving her a chance to answer, I continued, I believe that there are several ways out of this situation. One of the options may be moving to another place. You can try to start from scratch and start a new life somewhere else. If I were you, I would make that choice. But I'll make a reservation right away that I will never allow my children to spend a lot of time with you. Therefore, your decision to leave should not depend on their presence. Alternatively, you can try to survive and stay in this city, trying to preserve your dignity. But there is always a risk that your trick will become public or there will be difficulties with employment. Perhaps you would find solace in a relationship with a man who does not pay attention to your dissolute nature. But what kind of despicable person is this? Another option is to wallow in self-pity. But I sincerely hope that you will not choose this path. It would deprive me of the pleasure of watching you suffer, which is inherent in such a vile person as you are. However, I'm not entirely sure that my opinion has any meaning for such a stupid person like you. It certainly didn't matter to you at all when you made the reckless decision to enter into a relationship with your boss. I've been imagining this speech for months, looking forward to the opportunity to express my pent-up emotions. I should have felt a sense of happiness when I finally had the opportunity, but as I watched each word shatter what little was left of her spirit, I hoped to find at least some semblance of satisfaction. Instead, I felt empty and empty. After the divorce, life became complicated. 
Surprisingly, my lawsuits have brought much more results than I expected. The amount of the settlement agreement received from three companies whose employees entered into a relationship with my ex-wife amounted to just over a million dollars. This was a pleasant surprise considering that my lawyer warned me against significant results during the analysis after the game. Apparently, after the lawyer became convinced of how effectively he was conducting legal proceedings against my ex-wife's company, these companies wanted to avoid the negative impact of publicity and quickly resolve the issues that arose. As a result of a long process of investigation, filing petitions, testifying, and strategic leaks of information to the press, we managed to liquidate my ex-wife's company. At the same time, I started my own covert operation, discreetly sending emails to the heads of the companies that remained, revealing information about my wife, her boss, and their illegal connections. I wondered if these customers really wanted to maintain a relationship with a company that would inevitably face serious consequences over time. As the scandal unfolded, their incomes gradually declined, and employees who wanted to distance themselves from the scandal decided to quit, further contributing to the fall of the company. As a result, they declared bankruptcy. Alan Henderson was fired and left the city bearing the weight of shame. Although the check I received was only $200,000, it brought me more satisfaction than my previous victories. My pursuit of claims for abandonment of love relationships did not bring any results, as I did not expect. Nevertheless, for wives managed to get financial payments from their husbands, which led to subsequent divorces, although their consequences were far from the most glamorous. In addition, throughout this story, I unwittingly harmed myself by regularly encountering people who were familiar with my experiences. For some time, the bullying and ridicule reached an uncontrollable level. Whether it was luck or misfortune, it didn't affect me much. Already burdened with a sense of failure, someone's statements did not have much influence. Surprisingly, some of the taunts turned out to be quite clever. For me, it has always been the main thing to protect children from collateral damage, and I have largely succeeded. Although they experienced temporary distress, they quickly recovered. But my biggest triumph was my reinstatement as Vice President of Design and Development at CTS. Against the background of the personal problems that engulfed me, one of the distractions that gave comfort was the return to programming. For two years, I devoted myself to creating an add-on to the core CTS software, which easily combined with two competing software suites. Taking advantage of my development, I took up entrepreneurship and created my own company, starting the sale of my innovative creation. It is noteworthy that less than a year later, I received purchase offers from all three companies wishing to purchase both my company and the software. The culmination of this success was the conclusion of a stunning deal worth $11 million. In addition to the amazing remuneration I received from CTS, which was simply incredible. I briefly thought about retirement, but given the complete lack of social life, I realized that without having a reason to leave the house every day, I would most likely become a recluse. Fortunately, my newfound financial stability allowed me to hire a kind-hearted elderly woman who simultaneously served as a housekeeper and nanny for my children. Over time, our relationship began to grow stronger, and a year later, Mrs. Marin Jensen became a permanent member of our family, living in an apartment located above the garage in our new house. She personified the role of a grandmother for my children, radiating warmth and kindness but showing firmness when necessary but her invaluable advice stood out, especially having a rich life experience. She offered the children a unique point of view, which I appreciated very much. As a father, I loved my children unconditionally and tried to be a support and care for them, but I couldn't deny the scars, cynicism, and rigidity that had formed inside me. In moments of decision-making, she became my reliable confidant and advisor, giving guidance and wisdom. Over the years, the children turned into adults, and I treasured the opportunity to meet them and their families from time to time. Unfortunately, over the years, our once close bond has begun to weaken. I didn't hold a grudge against them for this change. It was clear that I needed to keep my bitterness at a distance so that it would not overshadow their lives. Mrs. Jensen stayed on my staff until the kids left for college, after which she retired. As a token of gratitude, I offered her a pension in the form of free accommodation and meals. For 15 years, she has always been present in my life. Throughout our communication, she tirelessly convinced me that I need to rediscover the joy of life and find a person with whom I can share my life. 
I sincerely appreciated her efforts, but in the end, she passed away with the realization that I would be alone forever. After the experience, it was very difficult for me to open up to anyone again. My friendships became superficial and did not bring true satisfaction. I rarely went to dating pages, except for a few group outings organized by random acquaintances. Over time, I gained a reputation as a cold and ruthless person who cannot be contradicted. It's clear that most people preferred to stay away from me, and I didn't hold a grudge against them. I understood that this isolation was a consequence of my own actions and choices. I carefully made sure that my intimate needs were met, and with the growth of my well-being, I was able to maintain a constant shift of girls, generously paying for their time and physical communication. Our meetings were purely of a working nature, I just studied with them and quickly said goodbye. But there was one person among them, Candy, or rather Mary Beth, as I learned her real name. She was a passionate and willing partner, and it seemed that our connection went beyond the customer-supplier relationship. It turned out that I also occupied an important place in her life. Jennifer's life took a difficult turn, despite the fact that I didn't understand why she persisted in trying to contact me for almost a year. I wondered if she was hoping for reconciliation or at least for a connection with our children. Perhaps I made it clear to her that this was impossible. Trying to keep an eye on her, I set up surveillance when she tried to stay in Chicago. In addition, I made sure that her employment record always came up when she applied for a job. As soon as Jennifer started dating again, and it happened apparently pretty quickly, I took it upon myself to send potential partners parcels with information about the woman they invite into their lives. It didn't really matter to me if they decided to keep her by their side when they found out the truth. The main thing that bothered me was that she couldn't just brush off the past and reshape history by ignoring it. After all, I had to deal with the consequences of our history every day, so it would be fair if she had to deal with it too. Unfortunately, one of her potential suitors tried to criticize me for torturing my ex-wife. One night, having plucked up the courage, he appeared on the threshold of my house and forcefully pushed me, causing me to stumble and fall while opening the front door. This turned out to be a serious mistake on his part. As a result of the collision, I was left with a noticeable black eye. He pleaded guilty to assault and trespassing, receiving a suspended sentence as a first-time offender. After this incident, Jennifer did not try to contact me again. A year later, I stopped watching her when she got a steady job cleaning rooms at a remote road hotel located about 700 miles away in the secluded wilderness of Virginia. The next meeting with her took place 16 years later, unexpectedly, at my daughter's wedding. Although the children talked to her, they never talked to me about their mother. It was at my daughter's wedding that I was shocked by her physical and emotional state. As it turned out, she managed to get married again, but her life got better for not long. On her wedding day, she suffered a grievous loss. Her husband, an extreme person, planned a joint parachute jump on the wedding day. Jennifer agreed to such an extreme act, but during the jump, something went wrong and her husband died, and Jennifer herself ended up in a wheelchair. In addition, she gained a lot of weight, at least 20 kilograms. She had deep wrinkles around her lips and other signs of smoking. In general, she looked elderly and haggard. But behind everything else, I still saw the woman I had put my heart into. I didn't feel anything for her, but I saw her. After the ceremony, I walked up to her and stared at her intently for a few moments. When I looked at her and met her eyes, I felt a deep sadness in her gaze. By the way she ruined my life, and now I'm not happy myself, 